the reach of Andrew Tate. The first part of this, I provided you with more information which demonstrated the various narcissistic indicators for Andrew Tate as a consequence of a detailed interview that took place last September between Hugo Rifkind of The Times and Andrew Tate. As I've explained to you, Tate is a narcissist, and his narcissism gives him considerable appeal to a large section of males of a young age who see him as some kind of idol. Basically, he is, without realising, a caricature of a particular type of man, the alpha male. He holds himself out as being powerful, able to boss women around who like to be bossed around by him, that he's successful, appealing, attractive, wealthy, and that he knows what he's talking about. Many of those aspects, having a good body, being attractive to females, having them respect you, driving flash cars, having a lot of money, are aspirations that many young men are easily led towards. Their own value systems see them as things worth having. And therefore, as a consequence of that, Tate is in effect the ideal role model in that regard. It's also the case that, particularly in the Western world, many young men, teenagers and those in their early 20s, of a particular cognitive function and strata of society, lack actual guidance and appropriate role models. Invariably, they are left behind. In such instances, that means that someone like Tate is able to exploit their lack of guidance and role model and take it to his advantage. And indeed, that is what has happened, that there is very much a gap that's there and Tate has filled it. Whether you agree with whether his filling of it is a good thing or a bad thing is irrelevant within the context of his narcissism. It simply demonstrates that his narcissism has driven him to portray a particular view and to behave in a particular way, and that that has proven attractive to a section of society that feels lost. And it would perhaps, in a sense, be an interesting question for society to ask itself, why is it that these people were lost in the first place and become so susceptible to, in effect, the seduction, in inverted commas, of Andrew Tate? In a sense, Tate provides an opportunity for people to ask, if you find him odious, if you find his values, ones which you can't get along with, if you find his attitudes towards women reprehensible, then you'll also recognise that lots of other people are sharing those views. And therefore, why has it got to this point? Why are so many people resonating with him? That is because they see the things that he provides as things to strive for. Why is that? Is it that these people have not been taught certain values? Or is it that they've been repeatedly told that they're rubbish and they're not wanted and they're not superior and they're not and that they are inferior to other individuals and therefore they feel thrown on the scrap heap with the consequence that they then, when someone such as Tate comes along, find a leader in him? Interesting questions. And his narcissism has been able to allow him to take advantage of that strata of society that finds itself lost and convert it into monetization, fuel, and to control thousands upon th thousands of people. We now return to the article by Rifkind that was headed, I'm sorry, I'm not sorry for interviewing the misogynist Andrew Tate. You recall that he made reference to the interview in September, and then he writes... I was keen. Tate is a cult figure for teenage boys. Ask your son if you have one. And he'd just been banned from most social media. I wanted to understand why. We sat in his cigar room with its tacky wood panelling, its even tackier massive glass safe, and he explained to me that it w wasn't misogynistic for a man to want to dominate women. Of course, he would see it as that, because his narcissism tells him that's the appropriate way to assert control, or to consider them his property, objectification, and the narcissistic mindset, or to expect them to put up with being a part of a large harem that included girls in their teens, even if the man in question was pushing middle age. Sense of entitlement, lack of emotional empathy. The real misogynist in the room, he added, was me, for disregarding the opinions of women who wanted to live like this too. What you're doing, he said, is being condescending to women. 
That, of course, is a form of validation of his own views. And, of course, what he's doing is invalidating the position of the other individual. Rifkin writes, All of this was ludicrous and horrible, but it didn't sound criminal. As such, I concluded he sat on the fault line of the sort of legal but harmful speech that campaigners have been worrying about for years. When the piece ran, though, nobody much cared about the conclusion. By far the most common feedback was from parents who had noticed their sons obsessing over this Tate guy and were grateful to know more. Next, there were messages from young men telling me that Tate was a hero and I was scum. Loads of those, actually, more than I'd expected. Finally, some deemed it outrageous I'd written it at all. As if, despite his millions of followers and ubiquity in playgrounds, Tate's career high was three largely appalled pages about him in a Saturday magazine. As if any interview, even one that called him creepy as hell, was an accolade like an OBE. Since his arrest, I've had much more of all three, but mainly the last. In particular, many object to my observation that Tate was engaging, despite being vile, even in person. It would be a lie, though, to say otherwise. His misogyny would put him beyond the pale in any social group to which I'd ever hoped to belong. But he knew how to talk, if only thanks to my reassuring penis. Is that surprising? As a YouTuber, charisma was his stock in trade. Indeed, as seducer-turned-pimp, I suppose it would be too. And, of course, that is part of his narcissism. Did I spend those three hours in intense conversation with a sex trafficker? Am I the Andrew Tate equivalent of Louis Theroux, who spent all that time with Jimmy Savile and failed to uncover the one thing we now all know about Savile? Time will tell, but the prospect doesn't make me feel super. Yet I knew, already, that his compound had been raided in the spring. Neither he nor his brother, Tristan, would talk about it on the record. Nobody had been arrested. Six months had passed. It all went in the peace. I also knew Tate's history in porn. I haven't been involved in that for a very long time, he told me, which I suppose may have just been a flat lie. He also insisted, to my open incredulity, that most of the girls who worked for me ended up being multimillionaires. On my tape, there's a bit where we tussle over comments he'd made on a previous podcast, because there have been many, many podcasts, about the male partners of women working in porn deserving a cut of their earnings because a woman's sexuality was the property of her husband. Objectification. At the time, I clocked this mainly as a yet another example of his crashing misogyny. Although it is also, of course, classic abusive pimp logic, as perhaps ben befits a man who now stands accused of being a classic abusive pimp. Clearly, I'm sorry I didn't get more out of him. I'm not sorry, though, that I took the gig. Boost his profile? This is provincial thinking. It was vast already. You, we, just didn't know. Kids were already emulating him and teachers were already worrying about him. For a while, he was literally the most Google name in the world. Really, I should have got there six months earlier. It's no longer inevitable, though, that a huge audience entails huge scrutiny, or any scrutiny at all. It is inconceivable that a film star or a politician could have reached Tate's level of fame without the likes of me pricking up their ears. Yet with YouTubers, as with t terrorist radicalisation or QAnon, this can all happen in the dark. Once we notice, it is always worth shining a light. If we fear too, as I said in the piece, I'm honestly not sure what we're here for. What Tate represents is what happens to popular culture when it becomes responsible to nothing other than an audience's cheapest whim. He peddles a domineering male sexual fantasy similar to that which you'll find in a gangster rap or The Sopranos or a million other places too, but without that extra narrative veneer that turns horror into art. At heart, Tate's base was an audience too young, or unsophisticated to know the difference. And I'm still unsure what can be done about that. To ban his sort of content in law, porn or norms on free speech probably wouldn't work. At the very least, though, we can know about it. Like I said, your sons already did. So observations there, extending on why Tate has the reach that he has. There's more that explains about the reach of Tate. Uh, this is written by David Brown, also of the Times. Dozens of British and American teenage men have attended a hustler's university, the Romanian headquarters of the porn empire run by a British influencer under investigation for alleged sex crimes. Disciples of Andrew Tate, a former kickboxer known as the king of toxic masculinity, have been visiting his high-security compound on the outskirts of Bucharest, where guns and cash were found last week. He runs an online university promoting get-rich-quick schemes for £39 a month to free the modern man from socially induced incarceration. He claims it has more than 160,000 members, which would generate almost £75 million a year. 
Neighbours of Tate's headquarters said yesterday that dozens of young men, aged about 18 or 19, have been visiting the compound from Britain and America since last summer. There were groups arriving three or four times a week. Sometimes there were three taxis a day, one neighbour said. They were young men. They said they were attending the Hustlers University. The university is Tate's home, gymnasium in the centre of the online sex empire. It is registered as a shooting range, allowing guards to bear arms. Neighbours said at least eight to ten women at a time were presenting online sex shows from the building with shifts working around the clock. The number of women began to fall after police raided it in April. The university became so popular that it was added to Google Maps to help taxi drivers find the building. The forecourt yesterday contained luxury cars, including some with Tate's personalised UK number plates beginning T8. They included a £300,000 Aston Martin Vanquish and an 80000 Porsche 911. Security cameras are positioned around the building and two guards are on continuous duty. Neighbours said Tate had bought the building a former storage depot in 2016 for about £180,000. He's built extensions and bought an adjoining property last summer for extra accommodation. You could see the women inside working on the video cameras, one neighbour said. There were women there 24 hours a day. Last summer these young English guys started to come. They'd get lost and ask how they could find the Hustlers University. I don't know what they were doing inside. The article then repeats information that's been provided before. It then tells us Tate often focuses on the alienation of young men. In one video he says, There is a large contingent of men out there who don't want to be told they are toxic because they want to go to the gym, who want to drive nice cars, who want to have money, who want to have hot chicks, and there's nothing wrong with us. He was banned from Twitter for saying women should bear some responsibility for being raped, but was reinstated after Elon Musk took over. Describing his work in a now-deleted post, Tate said, My job was to meet a girl, go on a few dates, sleep with her, test if she's quality, get her to fall in love with me, to where she'd do anything I say, and get her on webcam so we could become rich together. That demonstrates how he sees them as an object, and the love bombing that's done to assert control to get her towards that aim. A friend said that the brothers were in Bucharest preparing a New Year's Eve party at a 48-room mansion they own in the mountain village of Kamarnik. Tristan is reported to arrive by private jet on December 22nd, with his brother following five days later. The mansion bought a century ago was extended before Tate bought it about a year ago. The property, about 80 miles north of Bucharest, features an underground car park and swimming pool. Neighbours said staff had told them it was owned by a famous American sportsman. There's a mention of the criminal investigation that's been going on. Investigators are reported to believe that one of the performers brought in around £45,000 a month but received no payment and while the women were kept under house arrest. Tate claims the women kept 80-85% to 85% of the fees earned and that most of the girls ended up being multimillionaires. Tate's lawyer, Eugene Vidniak, said last night that the allegations related to content which appeared on TikTok and the OnlyFans subscription site used by sex workers. He said the brothers hoped to appeal to the Superior Court this week against their 30-day custody in a police detention centre. They deny the allegations and they want to cooperate with the prosecutors and declare their innocence. Vidniak dismissed suggestions that police identified Tate's location from Pizza Box that was visible in a video when he taunted the Swedish environmentalist Greta Thunberg 19. Two women dubbed Tate's angels were arrested alongside the social media influencer, Andrew Tate and his brother. One of the suspects, Luana Radu, 32, is a former Romanian police officer. She is said to have left the force in 2014 to work in video chat rooms, which attract men from all over the world and become a lucrative industry in Romania. She is believed to have served as a police officer for about four years. While working in video chat rooms, Radu, who also uses the name Ellie Dealey on social media, seems to have met Tate and later became his administrative assistant, helping him to manage his online business empire. Under Romanian law, she was obliged to submit an annual statement to prove her financial situation, which showed assets of about £400 to her name just before she left the force. The second woman arrested, Georgiana Naghel, 28, who also holds US citizenship, is described as a businesswoman and influencer who is believed to have dated Tate for almost a year. She was born in Bucharest and was believed to have met Tate through friends soon after he moved to Romania five years ago. After initially helping him with his business interests, the two became romantically linked and apparently became a regular fixture at exclusive clubs and bars in the city. A police source told Mail Online these two women are Tate's trusted lieutenants and his angels. Tate is being held on suspicion of creating an organised crime group to sexually exploit women. Further evidence of the narcissistic indicators of Tate, but also demonstrates, of course, how he doesn't see that he's doing anything wrong, that he sits within his narcissism, which tells him that all that he says and does is appropriate. Now, of course, as I've explained to you many times before, 
there are varying perspectives, and there'll be many people who will agree that his approach is appropriate, that there's nothing wrong with it. And there'll be many other people who regard it as misogynistic, horrific, and abusive. But his mindset is demonstrative of his narcissism, that complete belief in that what he's doing is both right, correct, and that you should accept that. It demonstrates the confidence that he has, the charisma that's associated with it. And of course, what he holds out are numerous things that, of course, many young men lacking leadership and guidance would see as attractive. Hence, the extension of his reach and how, in effect, he is able to ensnare millions of followers, tens of thousands of paid supporters, as a consequence of his ability to ensnare them, utilising this particular perspective and narrative. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.